uh, it's a great honor and uh, a great pleasure to be here today uh, and meet all of you. It's actually also from my side uh, a very special experience. Uh, not just because this is the first time I come to India, but also because this is an opportunity to meet so many people uh, that do what actually I do many kilometers far away from you. So this, I think, are uh, very nice uh, initiatives. And I also thank the Optical Society of America and the OSA student chapter, and particularly Prakash, for this uh, uh, invitation. Uh, so I, I'm working in nano-optics, so this lecture will be on nano-optics. And apparently, it seems that this has not much to do with advanced materials. But I hope I can convince you that uh, it's actually a very relevant topic nowadays, not specifically only for uh, uh, advanced material, but in general, to understand and to advance uh, nanoscience. Uh, before starting my lecture, I'd like to briefly uh, say a few things about the institute uh, I'm working in. So my affiliation is with the National Institute of Optics, which is headquartered in Florence, here. And that's actually where I work. And this institute has actually several branches in other cities in Italy that also do uh, specific activities uh, concerning optics. And this is a, a kind of a, a short list of some of the activities that we do. So we, you see the range is quite broad because we, we go from quantum metronidal optics, micro nanophotonics, to quantum degenerate gases and ultra cold atoms. We also do development of sources, especially the Terra regime, and also activities associated with the uh, preservation and study of the cultural heritage, and of course, sensing and metrology and, and many other things. Now, the second place, uh, which is uh, where actually I do my work, is LENS. So LENS means European Laboratory for Nonlinear Spectroscopy, and it's also located in Florence. And this is a, essentially a picture of Florence. And the uh, lens is, a, is, a, uh, is in Italy, but actually uh, as, uh, as a committee or a board member that come from different European institutions, namely the University of Florence, the Complutense University of Madrid, Karen Marie University of Paris, Max Planck Institute for Quantum Optics, and the University of Kaiserslautern uh, in Germany. Uh, uh, LENS is also uh, a member of the Laser Lab Europe, which is a large-scale European network for uh, uh, providing laser facility and grants for doing uh, specific experiments that require uh, uh, advanced laser techniques. Uh, research at LENS is highly interdisciplinary and mostly focused on fundamental research. Uh, we have four main topics or areas. So uh, photonics, uh, actually mostly nanophotonics, uh, structural dynamics and activity, so this is uh, mainly physical chemistry, atomic physics, and biophysics. And uh, actually it's nice that we uh, all share the same building, so it's really easy to interact with people that do very different uh, 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 research and uh, exploit actually this as a way to, to open your mind. Part. So now uh, let's start with the, uh, with the lecture. So, I'd like to start with this picture, uh, which shows the, the antenna that, uh, that Guglielmo Marconi more than 100 years ago built in Comba to send a signal across the ocean. <coughs> so at that time, that was uh, probably one of the most important achievements for the human time. And uh, after that, we know that uh, there has been a lot of progress in radio frequency antenna, and today we have very uh, sophisticated structures that perform a well-defined uh, task. Uh, now, 
The question is, uh, what is an optical antenna? And what it, in some sense, it inherits from a radio frequency antenna? And what can we do with this technology today uh, in optics? Uh, to give you an example, uh, let's start again, once again, from, from a radio frequency. So here you see a radar which is used to detect a certain object far away. Okay? Now, if we scale this kind of approach to optical frequency, we can, for example, pick up something which is very similar. So maybe we have now a, a laser beam and a cubette with a certain substance that we want to detect. And uh, although we are very different uh, objects, at the end of the day, we do the same thing. So we have an electromagnetic wave that interacts with the material object. And then we detect again this electromagnetic wave that has changed. And we know that there is sound. Now, the goal of nano-optics, one of the goals, then, is that we are not happy to detect a cuvette. <coughs> what we want to do is to push this to the uh, ultimate limit. And, and in this context, the ultimate limit is to see a single molecule. Okay. To give you an idea of, of how kind of difficult and at extreme this is, uh, think, for example, that this would be like to use a radar to detect a drop of water in the sky. OK, so this is not uh, the only thing uh, that happens in optics today. Uh, think, for example, that in information technology, uh, engineers are realizing that uh, electrical signals are not enough to kind of uh, part of the development of transistors. So they are starting to think about replacing partially electric, ele electronic signals with optical signals. And, and that is not easy. It's not easy because the space is very limited. And the uh, amount of uh, uh, materials that actually you need to interact with is very small. So in some sense, the challenge is comparable to the other thing that I described. And if you want to go to the most forefront effort that we have today is to, to really push this to not only have a single entity, but also to have a single photon that is used to exchange, uh, let's say, quantum information. So to summarize, the challenge we are facing today is, first of all, the mismatch between light and matter, nanoscale matter, to achieve strong and controllable interactions. Okay. Uh, next, the difficulty is that we deal with very small signals. Okay? And these signals can actually go down to single form. Third, there is nanotechnology. So 100 years ago, nobody would think about making a transistor or making a nanoparticle. Today, we can do that. And this, of course, allows, allows us to do new things and to solve problems, but actually brings new problems to us. And, and that is actually uh, uh, part of this exciting game. So let's now make things even more simple. And let's see the most elementary situation that, in some sense, is at the basis of what I was telling you. Uh, so we have, uh, 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 let's say, a light beam, a photon, or an electromagnetic field that interacts with a dipole. With this dipole essentially represents a material object. And, and, and this does something to the electromagnetic field, and we want to then be able to uh, 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 learn something from this object through the change induced on the electromagnetic field. So 
as I say, so typically it is extremely difficult to do that at the level of a single molecule or a single entity. And what people did in the, in the past, let's say, 50 years to enhance this interaction is through optical cavities. Uh, so the optical cavity essentially works on a, a very simple concept. So the idea is that uh, you typically have mirrors that take the light and put it back and cycle this process very many times. So although you have each time a very small interaction, because you do it thousands or even millions of times, this interaction effectively becomes stronger. So uh, this is very nice, but it's not enough. It's not enough to face the challenges that we face today. And to, to give you an idea, which is connected to the, <coughs> the previous slide, is let's see about the progress that we have in life. So the, in the past, we usually had to do with macroscopic light fields that were controlled using macroscopic pieces of metal. Uh, then we have been able to uh, focus light, and by doing so, uh, we could study smaller objects. But if you now think about uh, all the things that uh, I was discussing, the real challenge is that we now need to not only have light that interacts with nano objects, but we also need a nano size for light. So that's the big challenge, because contrary to a piece of material that you can, you know, crunch and make into very small pieces, light doesn't like to be confined too much. And so the big question is how are we going to do science and technology, a science and technology where, where everything is a big way and that we can control. So actually, although this seems to be the forefront challenge that we have, uh, it is not completely true. It is not completely true because actually there are areas that today already are based on this concept and give us products that work. And one example is, for example, uh, um, substrates sub that are used in, in biochemical sensor to increase the sensitivity of a sensor. And of course, these are microscopic objects, as you can see from this picture, that if you look down to the uh, fine structure of them, you see that these are nanoscale material that actually control light at the nanoscale. And by doing so, they are able to enhance the signal by orders of them. So what I will try to tell you is that uh, I will not talk mostly about applications. What I try to do is to convince you that uh, this is a way to push the limits of the light matter interaction part. And I will try to discuss this at the more fundamental level. So to start with, let's take now uh, a dipole, the dipole that we know. And let's assume that this is an ideal dipole, so uh, something that uh, as a cross-section which is given by uh, lambda q, three lambda q divided by two pi. Okay. So this is for a, for a two-level system or for a radiating type. Now, this ideal object, as we've shown here, can strongly interact with light, although is a microscopic object. And what is demonstrated is that you do not need an optical cavity. It's enough that you take a lens, and your lens 
if it's able to focus light to an affected area which is exactly out of the cross-section for this interaction process, it gives rise to uh, phenomena that are uh, the phenomena that you would see only with an optical tablet. And here is an example. So uh, the first thing is that uh, on resonance, light is completely reflected and nothing is transmitted. So that basically tells you that a single dipole is optically thick. And secondly, that the light that goes through is phase shifted by a large amount. And this is also remarkable because one single atom will basically phase shift macroscopically a laser beam incident. And we have also pursued this experimentally and we've shown that today uh, with a single molecule at cryogenic temperatures you can have a transmission attenuation of 25%, which is the work method. Uh, now the problem is that, unfortunately, uh, everything works well if you have an ideal system or something that is made almost ideal by using uh, cryostats and so on. Uh, the big challenge today is to translate these concepts into real world situations, okay? because that is what becomes relevant also for practical applications. So let's see what is the problem. Now the problem is that the interaction strength can be uh, written as the ratio between the cross section of the dipole divided by the area of the beam incident. Uh, so diffractions sets a limit on the area. And this limit is this one. So A has to be larger than sigma 0, which is the cross-section for an ideal type to divide by. <coughs> and the other problem is that we don't have ideal type. OK? So it means that there is a limit for sigma over A. And now the point, the point is what? are we going to do to solve this problem? So the first thing is to increase the cross-section by improving the optical properties of the meter. So that is what you can do by cooling down the sample. But as I say, this is something that we don't want to do. So we have to find other way. And secondly, we have to reduce the beam area. But uh, as I said a minute before, this is limited by diffraction. So how are we going to do that? And here, where optical antennas come into play. So the optical antenna, as I will show you, has this double function. So to increase the interaction cross-section and to squeeze light to the number scale. So let me give you an example. Uh, and this is related to the applications that I've shown already work today. Rama spectroscopy. In Rama spectroscopy, you have to face with a very small interaction strength, so the order of 10 to the minus 20 for a single molecule. And about 30 years ago, the spectroscopist understood that if you put the molecule on a rough metal surface, the signal is actually larger by orders of magnitude. And to understand this, they started to model this roughness as uh, small metal islands, and they understood that these small metal islands would, would actually give to strong electromagnetic fields locally, and these strong electromagnetic fields could be engineered to some extent to increase this uh, this coupling. And and then they, with the ability to make nanostructures, they started to do experiments where people work with the metal nanostructures. More or less in the same period of time, uh, a different kind of approach started to emerge. And that was the approach of near-field optical microscopy. Where the idea was not to increase the cross-section, but the idea was to reduce the area of the light field. And that was mostly 
for the purpose of doing high resolution imaging. So these two kind of uh, 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 efforts, uh, which which were kind of uh, kind of independent from one another, in the year 2000, mostly thanks to Dieter Kohl, which was uh, actually the father of near field optics and microscopy, and worked at the uh, IBM Zurich Research Laboratory uh, in Switzerland, realized that actually. This is the same problem. And not just that this is the same problem, but this is an antenna problem where I have uh, a source of electromagnetic radiation, and I have to interface this source to a far field radiation by means of a structure, which is the antenna. The problem is that now we don't have the antennas of our cell phone. But we have atoms and molecules, or uh, mati nanoscale materials, that emit optical frequencies. So also the nanostructure that represents the antenna has to be small, of the order of the wavelength, or even small. Okay? Uh, and so people, as soon as they understood this, then they started to exploit nanotechnology to fabricate uh, uh, structures that, in some sense, uh, uh, resemble antennas. So you see here, like a uh, uh, lambda alpha antenna, which is fabricated on the top of a near-field optical microscope dome. So to now <coughs> try to summarize this and, and uh, kind of uh, make clear the concept of an optical antenna. Let's take uh, the most simple example that every group of electrical engineers had at the beginning. So a dipole antenna, which is physically uh, made by two metal wires connected by uh, a current or a voltage. And, and this object is like a dipole, because it's a wavelength, and emits a field which is given by this expression. Now, uh, typically in a uh, uh, radio frequency antenna, you are interested in the far field. But we are not just interested in the far field, we are also inter interested in the near field, which is the region delimited by uh, the inverse of the wave vector of light, which at optical frequencies is of the order of 100 nanometers. So, <clears throat> that means that the near field is a nanoscale field. And now the problem is, what do we do with that? Well, uh, what we want to do is to use an antenna to not only engineer the far field, which radiates energy, but also an antenna to engineer the near field, because this near field is what we need to couple light with nanoscale object. Okay? And as you can see from this formula, the energy or the power associated with the near field drops dramatically as you move away from the source. So another important aspect is that the antenna that we have to use has to be very small, has to be sub-wavelength, such that you have a strong near field that you can provide to your material object. So what is the uh, basic ingredient to make an optical antenna? Well, this is, a, 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 in, in simple terms, a metal nanopart. So metal nanoparticles have been used uh, centuries ago by, by Greeks and Romans to, to make very nice uh, art craft because they saw that this, uh, actually, well, they, they didn't know that there were nanoparticles, of course, but they know that if you mix metal with, uh, with, uh, with glass and you, and you heat it up, and you get 
beautiful colors. And these beautiful colors are due to the fact that metals, when they are irradiated by light, can respond through the free electrons in a resonance manner, resonant manner. And this resonance, which is associated to the essentially the plasma, electron plasma of the metal, occurs in the visible spectrum range. So this is the kind of antenna resonance that we use, uh, which is uh, well described by a point-like oscillating light. And uh, this is a picture that shows that this uh, uh, system radiates energy very efficiently, which is also actually confirmed by the fact that the cross-section is very large here, and also has a very strong near field. So, altogether, uh, optical antennas are a highly interdisciplinary research effort. Because, of course, you, you have a lot of knowledge that has been developed by electrical engineers that you would like to use at optical means. But, of course, there are some differences, as I already started to tell you, because we don't have now wires, but we have uh, elementary entities like molecules, atoms, or nanoscale material substances. Uh, and these uh, also give rise to quantum optical phenomena, for example, the modification of this potential. Furthermore, because these are nanoscale objects, of course, material science is enormously, enormously important because we need people able to provide this kind of nanostructure. And then, of course, we have optics and photonics that provides uh, complex light field or guided waves that we want to interface with this technology. So this is an example of uh, a few antennas that are uh, currently available. So this is a metal nanoparticle attached to a, a, an optical fiber, and it is used to scan a surface. Uh, here we have uh, the so-called bow tie antenna, which looks like a bow tie, and is used also uh, to make surface enhanced diamond scattering, and in general to have very strong fins in the gap. Here we have uh, the so-called Yagi Uda optical antenna, which resembles the, the television antenna that you have on the roof, so which these uh, bars with different length. And the purpose of this antenna is to have directional emission of light. And lastly, we have a, a conical antenna, which here as well has the purpose of converting diffraction-limited light into a, a point nanoscale optical. So you see that, as I was showing you in the first slide, where there were these two free radio frequency antenna with different shape, and each of them with a certain specific purpose. Here as well, thanks to nanotechnology, we are able to make nanoscale antennas uh, that actually do different uh, jobs. I mean, they are always based on the fact that there is a near field and a far field, and that we engineer both of them. But of course, the optimization or the interest can be more focused on one or, or the other. Uh, I'm personally particularly interested in the interaction, as probably you understood from the other slides, uh, in the interaction of nano antennas with single quantum systems. And let me say briefly what you can do with that. So the idea is that the antenna, which is represented here by the uh, metal nanoparticles, provides an interface to free propagating photons with a very high bandwidth, so a bandwidth of the order of 10 femtoseconds, which is huge compared to the bandwidth of an optical camera. And secondly, the near field is used to exchange very rapidly optical energy between a material object, so in this case a, a single two level system, and the and their camera. And what you see here is a design that shows that antennas can give rise to modifications of the spontaneous emission rate. Okay, at some point we have to replace electronic circuits and think about light. 
in the 70s already. And, and so they, they thought about, OK, if I use light, then I, I need a nonlinear process to, op to process an optical signal. And, and they asked themselves, what are the limitations if I want to use that? So there are two, they classify two kind of processes. So one process is based on a absorptive nonlinearity. And what they said is that, OK, to, to make this work, I have a certain pressure, which is related to the energy of this transition and the lifetime of the excited state. Uh, the other way of achieving a nonlinearity is through a, um, a dispersive process. So essentially, uh, an intensity that induces a phase shift in the material, uh, in the field, excuse me. And, and the switching here is uh, effective if the phase shift is larger than a certain length, which is again associated with the intensity of the field. And so they gave scaling laws for these two processes that uh, are represented here. So I don't go into the details, but essentially what you see is that uh, here you have the switching time, so how fast you want to process information. And here you have the power. So to make this com competitive against the uh, uh, transistor, you have to be very fast and be very efficient in terms of power. And these are the scaling law that they have here. These are the limitations. So this is for uh, absorbing nonlinearity. Okay? And this is for uh, uh, dispersing nonlinearity. And I mean, material scientists and optical engineers have worked for 50 years on this problem. Try to, not just to push these limits, but just to reach these limits. OK, and here are some examples. So uh, for example, lithium niobate, gallium arsenide are not far away from these limits. And today, the state of the art has been achieved with a photonic crystal nanocavity with a, a very complicated blend of uh, 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 semiconductor alloy. Now, I, wanted, I want to show you that this technology can be useful to push these limits back. And uh, so first of all, we need to see an antenna as an optical cavity because it's useful for comparison. So if we translate the parameters of a cavity into the parameters of an antenna, then it's easier for us to see what, what is better. And here you see that the important parameters are the, the cavity loss, kappa, which is here for an antenna, the radiation loss. The coupling strength, G, between an atom and the cavity is also given here. And it is essentially due to the near field that I described before. And then we have some loss, radiative loss, which is also here. And this comes from the atom. So let's start from the quality factor, which is one of the most important parameters for a cavity. And here you see that uh, the quality factor for an antenna is inversely proportional to its volume. I don't go into the details, so take it for granted. But, so this uh, is uh, actually a fundamental uh, 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 equation that shows that as you decrease the volume of your antenna, the quality factor rises. And it does not go to infinite because at some point material losses dominate. Okay? The important message here is that in comparison to typical resonators that are uh, plotted here as a function of physical volume and quality factor, you see that the antenna has a physical volume which is orders of magnitude smaller and a quality factor which is orders of magnitude so, the fact that the volume is smaller is interesting. But maybe the fact that the quality factor is not interesting. So actually, this is not the case. And it is not the case because, as you see here, the quality factor gives a limitation on the speed at which you can manipulate light with a camera. And for example, if you had that quality factor, you would be limited to 5 nanoseconds. If you reduce it to 10 to the 4, you are 
limited to 5 picoseconds. And without meter antennas, you can reach the 10 picosecond regime. So that op opens also another perspective for optical resonance. Uh, the other important quantity in optical resonator is the whole body. So this is an example of photonic crystal cavity, where we have a cavity created in a periodically uh, structured material made of gallium arsenide. And these are aerons. Uh, the mode volume, which is associated with the uh, essentially field profile of the cavity mode, which is not the field, is given by a mode expansion of the cavity field, uh, where you take uh, essentially the field amplitude of one mode, then you square it, you invert it, and then you take the minimum value in units of lambda q. So this is the definition of the mode volume, which you find in textbooks. Now, the mode volume of an optical antenna is more difficult to define. Uh, and what we do to have a, an idea, qualitative idea of what it is, we simply start from the Purcell effect, which is given by this formula where you have the Q and the mode volume, and we uh, rearrange it to obtain the mode volume. And the Purcell factor is easily obtained even for optical antennas by looking at the modification of the spontaneous region. So, to give you an idea of what we're talking about, let me compare the two structures. So this is, this is to scale. So these are the dimensions of an antenna to scale. And you see that it's tiny compared to uh, uh, one of the most advanced uh, micro -cabinet. And if you look at the mode volume, what you see is that here as well, the mode volume is orders of magnitude smaller for an optical antenna than the mode volume that you have for a cavity. So in summary, uh, we have to design structures that compensate the fact that you have a, a small quality factor with a very small mode volume. And here, this is kind of the trend that is occurring today in, in using nanotechnology to, to make not just nanoparticles, but really more sophisticated structures. Uh, another important ingredient for uh, uh, switching and nonlinearities is what an optical pulse does when I send it on a, a material object which is coupled with an optical antenna. Okay? Uh, I don't want to uh, give into the detail of that for the sake of time, but the important message comes from this picture. So here what we have is a pulse which has only 10 photons into it. So it's a very, very low energy pulse, an energy of 2.6 up to two. Uh, and the dipole that gets the pulse uh, has a lifetime of one nanosecond and a dephasing time of 1.6 picoseconds, which corresponds to roughly 100 gigahertz. <coughs> and the duration of this pulse is 1 picosecond. So it's a relatively short pulse. Now, typically people think that if you take such a pulse and you send it on, on this dipole, nothing happens. So the interaction is so weak that uh, uh, the pulse goes through almost aperture. And this is, of course, bad if you want to, if you want to control very small signals or detect very small signals. Now, if you add an antenna to your object and you imagine that this antenna uh, uh, gives a certain enhancement which is parameterized by this quantity here, what you see is that as you increase the enhancement, this pulse starts to interact very strongly with this atom. And you see that for 20 enhancement, the excited state population, so the probability that you excite this atom, is 70%, which is remarkable, and that nobody has been able to show with any other uh, approach for this parameter. So that is also very interesting. And to put this uh, in a graph, understandable, uh, you see that 
we still have these limitations that I've shown you before. Now what, we have, what I have here is that uh, there are other technologies, so for example, semiconductor electronic devices for processing signal, which have also made a progress in this year. So they went, became faster and more efficient. And this is the photonic crystal cavity that was shown a few slides ago, so, which is kind of the record for photonics. And the idea is that instead of going to low temperature, so to pull down the system to make it an ideal dipole, which is giving very strong interaction times, but that is not useful for application, what we want to do is to nevertheless use these concepts where you have light interacting with single quantum system, and you use an antenna to bring this up to room temperature. So this is like the dream I have. So that you, using nanoscale material structure for optics, to control optics at the nanoscale, you can link them to other nanoscale material structure down to single entities to perform, for example, the control of optical signals with the efficiency of what you would achieve with atoms coupled to high finesse cavity, and speed, which you would achieve with sophisticated semiconductors in a new parameter phase. Uh, how much time do I have? Huh? Ten minutes. Fifteen? OK, so we have plenty of time. Good. Uh, so now let me discuss another very important uh, concept of an antenna, uh, the radiation path. So uh, typically, what you expect from a, a nanoscale structure is that this is some wavelength, so it will be a dipole. So this dipole radiates with a growth pattern and it's difficult to actually uh, use it because uh, light goes into all directions, essentially. So that is why it's important to define a directivity for an optical antenna, which is actually the same definition that you will use at target frequency. And let me uh, uh, discuss this here. So the directivity is essentially the maximum power which is sent to a well-defined direction divided to the total radiative power. Uh, and the gain is essentially the directivity multiplied by the antenna efficiency, where the efficiency is essentially the ratio between the power radiated to the power gain and the total amount of power which is processed, processed by the antenna. Okay? So in practice, what a directivity means for us is the fact that the cross-section of the certain interaction process is directly proportional to the directivity. So if you make an antenna which is highly directive, you are automatically are amplifying the interaction process. So uh, we worked on this concept, and we tried to develop monolithic directional antennas based on the concept of nanoprocess. So let me explain this briefly. Uh, this is a metal nanowire. Uh, the metal nanowire supports surface optical modes that propagate along the wire axis. Uh, uh, a nice property of these modes is that they don't have a cutoff. So even if you reduce the diameter of your wire, you still have a propagating mode. So if you then take the nanowire, and you sharpen it, then you can get this optical energy carried up to the nanoscale. And this is called nanofocus. Uh, so <coughs> our idea was to turn this into an antenna. So by cutting the wire and making it smaller, then you have a, a, a something which is more versatile, which now connects uh, light, not to another wire, which eventually gets absorbed by another wire, but to something that radiates to free space. 
and it predates in a directed manner, so, which is the important thing. Uh, so the idea behind that was to uh, obtain a kind of configuration where you imagine to send a focus beam, which is the pressure limited. Uh, this focus beam is coupled to the antenna. <coughs> And this coupling is very efficient now because the antenna is directional. So it can really match the, the pattern of the, of the focus beam. And then, thanks to the nanofocusing principle, you can uh, uh, reach a sample with a very strong and highly localized uh, electromagnetic. And to give you an example, uh, the full width at arc maximum of the optical mode there is of the order of 10 nanometers which is highly subwavelength. And the optical energy that you reach here is three orders of magnitude more than the optical energy that you have at the focus of the heat. Uh, so this is basically uh, what the antenna does. And <coughs> why is this interesting? Well, this is interesting because this is a practical realization of the concept that I was discussing before. So this is something that allows you to do controlled experiments where you send light, you squeeze light, and you interact in a controlled manner because this distance can be controlled to the nanometer scale using scanning probe technology with single molecules, with single quantum dots and other systems. And to try to understand if this is really what is happening as I was discussing in, in here. So uh, the other things, of course, are related to the linear optics, as I was, as I was discussing. And, and, uh, and now that we have that, uh, I would like to go toward the end of my lecture and discuss about a few of the things that uh, I like to do with this uh, 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 type of antenna. So here you see that this antenna is realistic, so you can make it using nanotechnology. And you see that the, the, the sharpness can be of the order of a radius of 10 nanometers or even less. And uh, the aspect ratio is also, is also well controlled because the length can be controlled very well. So this is very promising. So now let's see how to use this technology to, to verify the, the previous form. So uh, uh, let's start again from the ideal situation where we have a lens and we have here at the focus an ideal dipole and what we know is that the dip in the transmission is very strong and we have a very strong fish. Now what we want to do as I said is that we don't have an ideal dipole but what we want to achieve is to have uh, uh, the same interaction strength. So in order to do so, I told you, we have to squeeze light to the nano scale and amplify the optical properties of this object. So this is done now by this antenna. And this uh, optical arrangement is something which would basically reproduce this experiment, but now with the addition of this antenna. And what we hope to achieve is to demonstrate that actually you can detect, control, and manipulate objects like single molecules and so on under realistic conditions. So without having them in the gas phase or without having them in the gas So to <coughs> summarize this concept, uh, what you see is not just optical antennas give you uh, nanoscale control of light. But they also put you in touch and mix you with other fields, like quantum optics and cavity QD, ultra fast spectroscopy and fluid control. And that boils down to the slide where I was telling you this is really an interdisciplinary, an interdisciplinary uh, uh, field of research, where you don't have to go into it if you don't think about its connections with material science, with optics and photonics, with physical chemistry, with quantum optics. 
uh, I conclude because this is a, 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 a conference on advanced materials, so I just wanted to give a few slides specifically on what I'd like to do in the relationship with materials. So this is what uh, uh, a spectroscopy would provide to a material site. So it comes with a piece of material, and I illuminate it like that. But an advanced material can be, for example, a nanocomposite structure. And what, an, uh, what a material scientist would like to see from a spectroscopy is, well, tell me individually what each nanocomposite in this uh, macroscopic piece of material does. So you need to individually address these structures, and to do that, you need to do uh, nanoscale spectroscopy. Uh, I skip this because it's a bit uh, involved, but essentially, uh, the message is that with an antenna, not only we can provide to a material scientist a tool to image the material at the nanoscale, but because now we have a technology that is able to convert photons into very strong near field with a high efficiency, we can also add on top of it advanced spectroscopy. Spectroscopy that nobody has been able to implement at the nanoscale for 20 years. And this is something that we can do today, and people actually are starting to do today. And an example, which is probably uh, the dream of many people in spectroscopy, is to implement multidimensional nanoscopy. So when you have uh, ultra-fast pulses that come and they get focused to the nanoscale, and then you read the signal, which is a nonlinear signal generated by your material. And, and you plot, because you have several pulses, so you have several degrees of freedom, you do the Fourier transform on several parameters. So that gives you a multi-dimensional spectrum, where you have here, for example, two frequencies. And what this spectrum tells you is it tells you immediately information about dynamical processes and coupling effects in this material which you will not be able to easily understand with a conventional spectrum, one dimensional spectrum, even with a pumped probe technique. So this is really uh, the frontier, and I also started to analyze this uh, uh, at the moment only in theory, and the dream would be to also do that in practice. So to summarize this lecture, I hope I convince you that optical antennas are really what we need today to push the limits of light and particularly of light matter interaction. And now specifically, specifically for what concerns my interest and, and the research that we would like to do in Florence is to combine quantum optics, nano optics, and advanced spectroscopy to demonstrate that we can coherently access a quantum system in its environment without isolating it from the rest. And that would allow us in the future, hopefully, to really understand processes in materials, in solution, as they happen, and not by making model and hoping that this model would match what actually occurs in the end. And also, uh, the interest is related to nonlinear optics. Nonlinear optics, of course, for developing sensitive nanoscopies, but also to show that actually now, after 30 years, we have the possibility to process optical signals with energy which are competitive with respect to transistors. And last, uh, this can be very interesting for application on uh, the study of individual nanostructure, advanced materials, and uh, let me say, down to single molecules. So, with that, I would like to thank you very much for uh, the kind attention, and uh, I would be glad to, to take any questions you may have. Thank you. Uh, if you have a microphone, because then everybody can, otherwise I repeat the question. Yes. Are you measuring any nonlinear polarization signal from a single molecule?
for example, if I can have one generation. Yes, yes. Okay, so concerning nonlinear optics, uh, there is uh, a big interest about generation of uh, nonlinear optical signals at the nanoscale, uh, essentially using, using uh, uh, nanomaterials, which are not necessarily metals. They, they have, uh, for example, as far as I know, barium titanite is used, is, I mean, people try to make it in nanocrystal to, to generate second harmonic generation and use it as a, as a, as a biomarker because the signal is background free. Uh, there are also people looking at the generation, nonlinear uh, generation of, of <coughs> second and third harmonic uh, with metal nanopath because the metal has also a, a nonlinear susceptibility. Uh, in my case, uh, what I'd like to do is a bit different because I don't want to generate nonlinearities with the method. I want to look at the nonlinear signal generated in the material. And that is possible because if you think about the molecule and a resonant process, the nonlinear optical coefficient is probably 10 orders of magnitude stronger than what you would have in a, uh, in a metal or in the silicon. So there is no problem that you can distinguish between the two. So, and for me, the nonlinear optical signal is, for example, uh, the possibility to control very, very weak signals for signal processing. Uh, and the other thing is the nonlinearity that you generate is important because it's a more sophisticated way to get information from the material. For example, I did not discuss the slide with the formula because I thought okay, this is probably too much detail. But essentially, in that slide, what we say is that it's important to look at nonlinear processes because this can be mapped into uh, 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 not just absorption or emission, but to a, a series of elementary processes, for example, absorption, uh, re-emission and then reabsorption on another center, for example. And that nonlinear signal is uh, directly associated, for example, to an uh, energy transfer process in a nanomaterial. And this is something that you can't do with electron microscopy because uh, this process is so elementary that if you put electrons to see them, you completely destroy what you want to see. But using optical methods, you can see it without disturbing. The problem is that we don't have the, uh, at least up to now, enough resolution. Scattering. Scattering is going to like that? Yes, yes. So some phase matching here or something like that? No, actually phase matching here is not so important because everything occurs in a very small space. So in that sense, the process has to be highly efficient because you don't have much material that gives you more linear signal but you don't have the problem of this man. And in fact, this, <coughs> to be honest, is uh, something that we need in some sense to reinvent, because if you think about uh, nonlinear spectroscopies, they highly rely on phase matching, because they, they have been used with macroscopic materials. And so, uh, we basically, this is completely open research, that you have to understand how to uh, uh, reinvent nonlinear spectroscopy in the situation where you do not rely on phase matching, for example, to select a specific process that you want to see, because I didn't tell you, but when you start to have nonlinear processes, you can activate many of them at the same time. And what you would like to do to make also things understandable is to be able to activate only one. And typically, spectroscopy do that using phase matching, because it kills certain contribution. And this we can't, we can't, I mean, I don't know, I have to think about it, but it seems it's not doable. So we, we have to think about other ways. Thank you. Thank you. Yes? Excuse me, let me, let me wait there. Can you please compare the optical angular with the angular angular wave rate? 
yeah, so uh, uh, the question was, can you compare the optical antenna to the conventional uh, radio frequency antenna, right? <clears throat> so uh, there are there are uh, concepts that can be used in one area, and, and especially in radio frequency where there is a lot of knowledge, and brought to optics. But we should be very careful when we do that, because uh, actually many things change, and, uh, and also the, the scope, the scope of this technology can be completely different. I mean, as I showed, I, I've been talking for almost one hour about molecules and atoms, something that an electrical engineer in radio frequencies completely ignores. So uh, the the trend was at the beginning was to uh, copy radio frequency designs, miniaturize them, and try them in optics. So for example, the, the picture where there was this uh, uh, line of nanoparticles with different height. So this, I said, is an optical Yagyud antenna. So this is a, uh, this is a, uh, uh, well, it, it works also at optical frequency, so that means that the analogy exists and can be used. But it works, but probably is useless. Because then once you've done it, how can you actually make it a useful device? Maybe yes, maybe no, we don't know. I mean, the reason why today, I mean, think about the first graph. So the antenna of Marconi is just a wire. Okay. So that worked. But today, we don't just have this. We have uh, other, other shapes. And the reason why we have specific shapes is that because the concept of the antenna has to be translated into a working technology. And translating something into a working technology is not only meaning that you have a physical principle into play, but you have other important factors. And these other important factors can be uh, technological factors, or let's say engineering factors, so to feasibility, uh, accuracy, reliability, and so on, and down to economical factors. So you can do the best thing in the world, but if it doesn't have an economical impact, nobody will use it. So especially here, where you actually are a technology institute, you also have to keep that in mind. So you start with fundamental research, and today, more than before, is extremely relevant for innovation because in many, in many uh, technologies, people start to really face fundamental problems that are related to fundamental research in physics and chemistry. But you also have to be able to make the jump from the physical phenomenon or chemical phenomenon that you understand and that you can repeat in your laboratory into a device. And that's what, what makes uh, an idea uh, a technology. And then this device has to become a product. And here there is another huge step. So it's very, it's very challenging. And, and especially if your aim is to work uh, with that in mind, you have to really keep all these steps really clear, clearly in front of you. Okay, Excuse me, but I'm very sorry to bother. Uh, very so, uh, maybe, uh, the, 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 you are the director, right? So, thank you very much. Uh, this is like my small present for the invitation. And these are the uh, tires for the institute, which are supposed to be oh. I now request our head of the department, Dr. H. Andrew Bose, to honor the speaker with a momentum. <laughs> 